Welcome to Europe Debates. I'm Richard Milsom, the Executive Director of the European Conservatives and Reformist Party in Brussels. And today we have a super panel of leading politicians from across Europe in order to discuss the Brexit trade deal. The end of the year-long transition period is perilously close, and today's debate could not be closer to a major announcement. And we wait with bated breath to see if the negotiating teams from both sides have managed to agree the United Kingdom's final exit from the European Union. Actually, the news channels have been surprisingly quiet. Over the weekend, there was more coverage of the Crown Netflix series than Brexit. However, whilst many have said this before, it really is crunch time. Now, despite the encroaching deadline, the prospect of a trade deal still seems to be uncertain. The European Union has been entrenched in its positions, refusing to give ground to the United Kingdom on several of the key remaining areas. The three main sticking points in the talks have been fish, competition regulations, and how to govern any eventual deal. With both European and British businesses dependent on the continuous undisrupted flow of trade, the importance of reaching agreement is more important than ever. With a no-deal Brexit on the horizon, what needs to be done to ensure that an amicable trade agreement can be reached? What ground could be given on either side to make it possible? And what areas of greatest concern for the UK and the EU? And most of, importantly of all, will the EU meet the deadline of December the 31st? Now, today's, today's debate is live streamed across multiple platforms, including YouTube, Facebook and Twitter, as well as the ECR party website. And we're very grateful to the, uh, to the many of our supporters and followers that watch these debates uh, and encourage them to ask questions via the comment sections, which I will try to relay to the panel if time allows. So without further ado, let's get it started. And I would like to welcome our first speaker, Stuart Jackson. Stuart is a former member of the British Parliament for Peterborough. During his time as an MP, he worked closely on Brexit, including being one of the leading MPs who called for the referendum in the first place. Since leaving Parliament, he's acted as Chief of Staff to David Davis, the Secretary of State for leaving the European Union, and now has set up his own consulting firm, Political Insights UK. So Stuart, thank you very much for being with us today. And to get it started, you've been closer to this than anyone in the whole process, and perhaps uh, for our international guests, you could give us an overview of where we are from the British perspective, briefly how we got to this stage and what we might expect in the com coming days. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. And it's certainly true that uh, I lived through many of the Article 50 processes and went eyeball to eyeball with Michel Barnier and his team and Martin Selmayer and others in the early stages post-2016 uh, referendum. And I've lived this experience for four and a half years. I think we're generally in a good place in terms of wanting a deal and expediting a deal, albeit a thin trade deal, in mu the mutual interests of both the United Kingdom and the European Union. Remember, the e EU um, was put in a position where uh, the UK government was weak. Uh, it didn't have a majority after 2017. And the main negotiations led up to checkers, which was seen by many Conservatives and Brexiteers as a capitulation. Uh, consolidating other um, issues which the uh, EU had uh, received in terms of, of common ground uh, and concessions from the UK on citizens' rights, a surveillance authority, uh, a unilateral decision on defence, intelligence and security to uh, offer that to the EU. And of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which, uh, which was about uh, potentially questioning the integrity the political and legal integrity of the United Kingdom. And, and these were all uh, offers that were made. I think the problem has been that the EU has often uh, uh, got strategic errors uh, in place by taking notice of the wrong media outlets who purport to speak for what Britain and the British government think. You know, reading The Economist and The Guardian is not necessarily... Uh, the, the best thing to do if you want to understand the uh, rationale of the British government. And I remember going to Germany in 2018 and being told by a senior industrialist in Munich that uh, within a matter of weeks, there would be primary legislation in the British Parliament to have a second referendum. And this was because this gentleman had read this in, uh, you know, Remain uh, outlets. 
I think the other problem is this obsession with parallelism by the EU, that nothing's agreed till everything is agreed and that you had to move forward on everything. And I think that has stymied and circumscribed the ability to actually get to grips with the details, the granular technical details of the uh, text. That we are now looking at legal text of five to 600 pages. And I think the fact that we have made great progress in th on things like geographic indicators, on civil nuclear energy, on uh, air safety, uh, on uh, on uh, citizens' rights and defence is, is good. And now the whole issue, the shooting match, comes down to the level playing field, fish and governance issues. And I remember my boss, David Davis, was ridiculed for saying that, it, that, that the deal would be done in the last 10 days rather than the previous 10 months. And actually, he's been proven right. I think on the 28th of December, we will see an indicative vote in the European Parliament to agree the deal with Barnier's support. And I think that will be because Macron and Merkel have the political willpower and firepower to make it happen. So I think notwithstanding COVID, which has actually worked to the advantage of getting a deal, because I think it's, it's shown the EU the cliff edge that they could face, um, and notwithstanding the internal market bill, which we'll talk about later, I think we are in a good place to secure a deal which will work. And finally, I'd say the naysayers who told us that it would take three, four, five, ten years to get a deal, I think they've been repudiated by what's happened in Japan and Canada and potentially the United States where we're on the fifth negotiating round. So it's not all beer and skittles, as they say in England. But it is, I think, uh, a, a much more positive picture than even six months ago. Well, thank you, Stuart, for those very insightful comments. Uh, for, for all of us who have been involved with European politics for some time, it is always at the last minute, locked behind closed doors in a trilogue. You know, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And whilst it probably is 95 percent there. Um, you know, it always comes down to the wire in this place. Uh, one person who knows more than more than that than many is David Campbell Bannerman, our next speaker, or DCB, as he's more fondly yeah. known, uh, who's a former member of the European Parliament, the East of England. Uh, during his time as an MEP, he was the standing rapporteur on the trade agreement with India and chairman of the delegation for relations with Iraq. David was the creator of the Super Canada UK EU model uh, that Boris Johnson has referred to many times and to using GAP24 as an interim deal. He's also authored several books on Brexit and advised the UK government. So David, thank you for being with us uh, here today. Um, I was reading a tweet recently from Barnier where he grandly stated this is the first time in the EU's 60 year history that they've negotiated a trade treaty with a third country that is on a zero tariff, zero quota basis. And it has no precedent, whether with Canada or with Japan and is being negotiated in a context of regulatory divergence, not convergence. How do you interpret this settlement? And on trade, what would you like to see happening this week? Well, thank you, Richard. And hi to the ECR group. It's great to see you all. Sorry we can't go off the Place Luxembourg for a beer afterwards. That's a tragedy. I don't know what you do in Brussels if you can't use uh, parts of restaurants, but there you go. Um, yeah, well, thank you. I mean, yes, just on Super Canada. I mean, that's where I hoped we'd end up with. Um, and uh, what I mean by Super Canada is a deal that is bigger, better and wider than the Canadian deal CETA, which I was involved with. I met uh, Trudeau at Strasbourg when he signed it. Um, unfortunately not. It, it seems to be a much thinner thing on, on offer. And I think that's a major mistake um, on the EU side because it, it works both ways. Um, and I think my main point today was that uh, I would point out to the EU and, and really urge, particularly the council, um, that sets the guidelines, you know, to reconsider because it's not the case. It is a fallacy to think that uh, Britain needs a trade deal more than the EU, um, which is something that came up in the referendum as wrong then. And let me just give you some statistics, if I may, which you don't often hear. But the first thing is that, OK, you can say, you know, the EU economy is put together as big in the UK, fine. But in trade terms, the UK is about to become your second largest trading partner as of the 1st of January after the United States. 
And there is a 95 billion pound surplus, trade surplus in goods uh, on the EU side with the UK. We're a massive market in those terms. And that has been put at risk. It's actually bigger than the entire Bulgarian economy. Um, if you're from Bulgaria, Bulgaria high. Um, but it, it is true, again, you hear these statistics, 43% of our exports goes to the EU, 43%, fine. But actually, as a share of our economy, um, trade with the EU is quite small. We're, you know, International trade overall is only about a third of our economy, less than a third of our economy. And actually, goods to the EU is 7.5% of our economy, um, and 13.5% when you add in services. I'm not saying it's unimportant. Clearly, it is important. Um, but it has to be said in context, nearly 70% of the British economy is trade within the uh, UK, within our internal market, our own single market. Um, and that is pretty dominant. Um, you also have to add into the equation that London is the largest financial centre in the world, not just Europe. Uh, and when there's, you know, talk of all this rivalry, Frankfurt's only the 20th largest and Paris the 23rd. I mean, Edinburgh in Scotland is actually la larger than either of those cities in financial centre terms. So it's important that access is maintained both ways uh, in that regard. Um, Civitas, uh, the think tank, has done an analysis that shows that in the event of no deal, the UK would pay five billion pounds of tariffs, fine, but, but the EU would be paying 12 billion pounds of tariffs. Um, so, you know, it isn't the case that Britain needs the deal more than the EU. I think in terms of negotiation, David Frost, Lord Frost, who I know, um, has, has all he's asked for is what has been offered other nations. He's kept it very close to Canada, um, to um, Australia, the, the New Deal going through, uh, to Japan. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, we're not asking, we, we, we're just asking to be treated like a sovereign, independent country, like these other countries are. Um, as regard the actual guidelines from the council, we, you touched on it, fishing. Well, fishing, the access to fishing waters is really a UN issue, United Nations, United Nations UNCLOS, the law of the sea. Um, the, the, the selling of the fish you catch into the market is a trade issue, but access to the waters really shouldn't be part of this, only the trade aspect. Um, if you look at level playing field, the so-called level playing field and regulations, Again, you know, that isn't being asked of these other countries to be tied into EU laws. We didn't. David, you're frozen. I think I'll ask for EA, which uh, Norway has. The, what I was going to say also is that when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the court, uh, issue, which is the third issue, then Canada has again a great model, which is adopted um, in that model in CETA. And according to the ECJ, uh, under uh, its opinion 117 of April last year, um, that's fine by them. You know, it, it, it complies with EU law. And I don't know why we don't just actually use that for this deal as well. So a lot of these points really aren't very substantial. But I think the problem is political, not on trade. So I think what we are heading towards, just finally, is I'm afraid I think it's going to be no deal for now, as I put it, which is, look, you know, we can carry on negotiating. But what really needs to change, in my view, is that the EU needs to look at its negotiating guidelines, drop the political punishment guidelines we've got at the moment, and actually adopt proper trade guidelines. You know, we are like Canada, like Japan, like Australia. I know you don't want that. And, you know, it's been debated. But the point is, that's where we're at. And that will work for everyone. And we'll end up with a great super Canada type deal, which I think will benefit us all. And we can all move on uh, and without, you know, heavy tariffs between us, which is in no one's interest. So I hope that, you know, the guidelines are changed and more realism comes in based on those actual statistics you don't hear very much so hopefully uh, you, you heard it here for, first thank <laughs> well thank you david and it is interesting isn't it where we have two 
uh, blocks which are already already regulatory aligned, actually a trade deal should be very straightforward. Uh, yeah, should can't be, be one, simpler <laughs> in one, theory. One piece of paper saying that we recognise each other's standards and uh, and off you go. But sadly, mutual recognition, yeah, mutual recognition, there, yeah, yeah, the full dimension. But thank you. We'll, we'll return back to some of those points in a moment. Um, let me now bring in Charlie Beamers. Charlie's joining us from Sweden. Uh, Charlie is a member of the European Parliament. He was first elected in 2019, and before that, he was the leader of the youth wing of his party back in Sweden. Uh, Charlie recently wrote a highly publicised article for the Daily Mail, in which he talked about why he felt that Barnier was for failing at his end of the deal when it came to negotiating Brexit. So, Charlie, let me start you off with a, a general question. Do, do you expect that we will reach a deal by the, uh, the deadline at the end of December? Uh, and what are the remaining concerns? I'm particularly interested to hear from, obviously, the Swedish perspective when it comes uh, to a deal. Thanks for having me, Richard. And um, dare I predict the outcome of all this? I mean, uh, uh, taking all the extended deadlines historically into account. Uh, uh, but if I have to, I would say that uh, a, um, a deal seems more and more likely. Uh, and we hear rumors uh, over in Brussels that... Uh, we will be called in between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, so that's what me and my team are expecting um, over here. Um, and I certainly hope that um, both sides will be constructed. But as said, uh, uh, there are um, political obstacles here rather than technical or economical that uh, stands uh, in the way. Just look at uh, the fishing issue, which uh, is a litmus test, uh, understandably, for Boris. Uh, it's been a, a, a token issue or symbolic issue for the UK for decades uh, since, since uh, the country joined the EU. But now also for Macron, who will, who's uh, fearing criticism from the right if he gives up on uh, fishing rights for French fishermen. So... Uh, I just hope that uh, some adult in the EU room will stand up and, and uh, you know, um, uh, point at uh, the broader EU interest in all this. Because uh, th that, w that is clear that uh, uh, Sweden and a lot of other countries, we are very uh, dependent on trade with the UK and uh, this is what we want. So that's obviously one major obstacle still, but uh, I mean... There could be a fudge. They, they, they could find a way to, you know, annually review it or review it every five years or something. And that's the typical EU way of doing things. You know, you create a fudge and then it leaves a sour taste for, for years to come. Uh, so I, I guess uh, I guess they'll do this, uh, that this time as well. Um, the other major political concern is, of course, a, a successful Brexit. Uh, that uh, will inspire others to, to maybe consider, uh, you know, uh, thinking forbidden thoughts uh, about leaving the EU. And nothing could be worse in the eyes of Brussels. Uh, the third concern is, of course, and uh, David addressed it um, uh, very well, a level playing field. Um, so a month ago in Politico in Brussels, I read an interesting piece about the diverging paths that the UK and the EU will take after uh, the full breakup. Uh, and um, uh, while the EU uh, concentrates its competition policy uh, on creating so-called European champions, support for big companies, um, not least uh, the German, um, the German uh, government is, is uh, uh, going in that direction with the Christian Democrat uh, um, minister, Peter Altmaier, uh, saying that, yeah, we should have less competition in Europe in order for European companies to remain competitive abroad. Well, uh, the UK wants to, to take another path and, and uh, look at future um, success stories rather than only taking vested interests into account and uh, this is uh, this is a major concern for the eu because right over here i'm actually in brussels right now and 
uh, a few blocks from here, you have the European Economic and Social Committee that uh, is, is part of the sort of uh, EU legislation sausage factory and uh, puts in, puts in um, industrial interests into uh, draft legislation so that uh, established companies can have their interests looked after. Uh, if you go a little bit further, and you know all this, Richard, you'll find uh, the big square in Brussels, Grand Place, where you have the old guild houses. And there is a, an historic link between those two places. Um, and this is what Brexit challenges with its free market approach in terms of, of uh, deregulating uh, what was regulating during 40 years of EU membership. And uh, in terms of economic, environmental, social uh, legislation, this is the last thing uh, the EU wants to see. And Ursula von der Leyen already made it clear. But remember, uh, remember uh, that uh, 20 years ago, the EU launched the Lisbon pro process. Uh, and uh, they said that it should be, Europe should be the most competitive and dynamic economy in the world. And um, they had a benchmark for R&D of 3% of GDP. Um, I don't remember anyone uh, announcing the burial of the Lisbon strategy, but it was buried uh, because uh, in 2018, the European, the European uh, Parliament issued this study, um, monetary policy in, in an era of low average growth rates. And to uh, my British friends who are uh, thinking about few possible compromises with the EU, don't compromise on this. Your departure is, is partly due to the sluggish growth of the EU economy. Your departure is a great agent for change in the whole of Europe. And let's look at this in a hundred years perspective rather than in a five-year perspective. This sets uh, the stage for many decades to come. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. I was talking to somebody from the Commission the other day who who uh, compared uh, Euroscepticism in, uh, in the UK, saying that in, uh, in Brussels it was 10 years behind. Um, so, I, you know, I do think there's a lot more of this, you know, stuff to come. And either the EU has really got to sort its house out or, um, or there'll be other people moving towards the door. And, of course, the UK <laughs> needs to set the example uh, and, uh, and get the best possible deal it possibly can out of this. But we'll come back to some of those points. Well, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Roberts. Uh, Robert Zieler is joining us from Latvia. Uh, Roberts has been a member of the European Parliament for National Alliance Party since his country joined the European Union in 2004. Uh, before that, he was the, the country's finance minister. Uh, Roberts, you um, is a very busy man in Brussels uh, and engaged on many committees and many activities, including, of course, the annual financial framework. So you know where all the money's going as well. Um, but Roberts, just a general question to, to start us off. Uh, do you expect that we will get to the get to the deadline with the deal um, and you know what are the concerns uh, of you from coming from the Baltics but also the concerns of the European Union when it comes to striking this deal? Oh, <clears throat> well uh, so thank you Richard for organizing this event and nice to see uh, our, our colleagues former colleagues like David David here see and uh, I just can start with right. some joke there is uh, I was last time in, in Brussels so it's uh, in July so it was a uh, COVID uh, safe situation uh, because otherwise I have to always to do some self-isolation after, after I coming from Brussels to Latvia yeah. and, and now, now we're also opposite so so that's why I'm working remotely and it's possible it's uh, it's, it's good actually so nice to see you so on Richard on your sure. question um, uh, well I think deal will be, will be done and, 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 and including the European Parliament will be very busy in December not only because the deal on Brexit will be done I'm sh I'm almost sure of that and I will come back in a few moments. But also you touched the issue on MFF and all this rule of law issue, which is blocking a recovery and resilience facility and all those 1.8 trillion issues of money for next seven years. So all, all member states, almost all member states are expecting as soon as possible. I think also this deal will be done, even if it looks very difficult, but I guess German presidency would like to finalize all those issues. and. And uh, the, why in Brexit case, I think it's, it works. If you remember, 
how you is negotiating uh, some many years ago Uruguay round uh, with the WTO. There was last 24 hours where everything was done at the end. So I think uh, and Barnier is. I think it's. Uh, we, we we can we have a, perhaps have a different views on what he's doing in particular for British. I think it's sometimes painful what he's saying, but of course he's very experienced. Uh, he's very experienced man, starting from uh, Alberville uh, well, Olympic Winter Olympic Games organizing and different ministerial position, different commissions position. Also, uh, he visited Latvia several times when he was uh, also responsible for. Uh, enlargement of of of, of you. It, it was very much in my country in Latvia. So that's why I think it will be done. There are some noisy issues like fish, of course, we touch it, but it's noisy mainly. Uh, from the interest group's point of view, there are not a very big interest group behind it. It's not a big issue for economy, actually. And that's why I think it would be the most important how politicians on both sides of the channel will decide this uh, to put this noise a bit down and to create uh, both are winners or something like that. Uh, and also, uh, I think state aid issues, um, it's, it's, it's uh, also very difficult because now, as you may know, in the EU, as also, there are no state aid rules. They are very soft uh, and will be for, uh, for several years, will be very soft, definitely. And also creation of uh, European champions, as Charlie said, it's also the issue which is uh, on the table in the EU. We, we also have a new priority since b Brexit happened, uh, not completely as we're discussing now, but uh, legally, politically. Uh, this, uh, this, from this year, uh, we arrive with a uh, Macron strategic autonomy concept, which is a totally different issue. And if I'm looking for the Latvian perspective, we always were looking and we lost your, uh, not completely, you are still in NATO and it's very important, but if, for Latvians, historians, Lithuanians, it's always important, UK is as our geopolitical partner. It's very important with a strong army, with a, with a no, uh, know how to say a smiling face to Russia or something like that so you understand how dangerous this enemy is. And also I, we lost a bit uh, on US free market supporters. That's, that's also a big issue if it's clearly damaged, you can see it already now. So, and also for us it's important uh, community, many Latvian citizens decided to stay in, in UK even after Brexit. So, so that's why I think uh, also, in our interest, would be a good deal, but on reality, uh, anyway, there will be some difficulties after 31st of December this year. Whatever will be deal or no deal, there would be some new situation with a uh, with a track. Well, with with the track businesses of uh, lorries uh, coming uh, and going to through the channel, and uh, and also I think a Euro tunnel issue could be some. I hope aviation would be more or less clear. Uh, there will be no confusion. Even it's enough confusion in aviation anyway now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Robert. So, um, actually, let let me stay with you just for for for, for the second question because I know you've been very active in opposing the EU mobility package. Uh, which is also one of the major sticking points for the UK, as you know, we discussed. It's committed to a level playing field, particularly on road transport. Um, can you see? Can you see a road through this? What? Uh, what? Could, can you see how there could be a compromise for this part of the deal? Yeah, I think there will be compromise related with the permits for drivers to recognition and things like that, because uh, will, will be some tariffs or it will be no tariffs, uh, whatever. For example, let's take automotive industry on both sides of the channel again. There is a huge lobbyism also from the Germans coming uh, automotive industry and other, other EU uh, manufacturers to increase the level so-called national, well, nationally built uh, part in the, in the car or the details of the car because, well, details are, are, are done sometimes in UK and sent back to Germany and, and opposite. It's, it's, well, transport is, uh, when it's free, and it's, of course, it's a relatively low cost thing. So that's why matter is to produce in different, places and just to move from one place to another so separate the details and parts of the of the manufacturing in this case car so i think this lobby is very strong that's why i, I don't think mm -hmm. that would be big stack uh, practically uh, there would be some confusion as i told perhaps in the first few days but there cannot be disaster with a uh, with a uh, road uh, freight business so otherwise uh, it would be damage on both sides uh, of, particularly in germany and, and that would be disaster for uh, for uh, German presidency finals uh, final hours. Is, isn't Richard, can I um, can I just come back on a couple of those points if, yeah, if sure. that's okay? Roberts makes a very good point um, that there is going to be a it's not a one way street as to whether Brexit is so called damaging because 
it does have a geopolitical impact on the existing states in the EU. And of course, the UK was a lodestar for deregulation and the free market. And you only have to talk to Dutch folk, uh, Swedish folk, Danes to understand that there is now an imbalance between the North and the South in the European Union. Um, and ironically, of course, the UK took a very liberal approach to state aid when it was a member. It didn't apply state aid very much compared to many other countries in the European Union. So it's ironic that we're having this trench warfare over level playing field, uh, which, is, which is very interesting. I mean, the UK did score uh, a victory right at the beginning, I think, by forcing the EU to drop the concept of dynamic alignment, which is anathema to those of us in favour of a, of, a, of a sovereign state. Coming back to what Charlie said, we should never forget that Martin Selmayr said four or five years ago that the strategic objectives of the EU were twofold. One is to make Brexit as painful and difficult for the uh, UK as possible in order to encourage others never to contemplate it. And I think he succeeded in that respect because it has been inordinately painful. But the other thing is, I would say, uh, more important is to undermine the competitive advantage of the UK as an economic competitor to the EU. And I think we should never forget that that is the political aspect to which David Campbell Bannerman refers. It's about basically marking our card as a competitor when we've left the EU. And I think, I think we shouldn't be too sentimental about what the EU is after in that respect. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Thank you. Um, can I bring David back in? Um, because... You know, I mean, the current negotiation is primarily about goods. Um, but of course, for the UK, financial services, digital markets, vitally important. Um, bearing in mind the, the importance of these uh, sectors for the UK, how do you see the progress being made in the future, uh, perhaps within your Super Canada model? Yes, thanks, Richard. I, I mean, uh, services are always a slightly difficult one because they're on the edge of a lot of these FTAs. Um, like with Canada, CETA has a bit on financial services um, and Australia will have a bit more. The EU Australia deal should have a bit more on there. The WTO, the World Trade Organization, is doing quite a, a bit. It's trying to push services more, but it's, it's had a bit of resistance and it's not gone as far as it should. And that would be quite trans formative really for everyone doing more on services but I mean it, it's the, the the key difference really free trade agreements start with goods because you have hard tariffs on them or quotas um, you know a certain you know 100,000 tons at five percent tariff or whatever it is that's the kind of thing you, you you're quite easy to strike down a lot of that to put it to zero and that is the, you know, the fundamental starting point, a lot of FTAs. And when you get into services, you don't tend to have tariffs on services uh, in that way. You have licensing. So, you know, we, we have this EU passporting issue. But a lot of our companies, if they want to continue to trade and selling in uh, the EU financial service market, they go through a subsidiary in Dublin or, or around the EU. Um, and also the other way around, we've had 1,300 EU companies come to London, actually. You don't hear much about that either, uh, to set up shop, because obviously London is a huge, uh, very important to EU companies in terms of financing. Um, and a lot of that's going on. Um, it's, it, it sounds like it's quite disappointing. I mean, from the EU agenda point of view, they're more interested in the tariffs, because a lot of what they sell to us is agricultural. You know, it's French cheese. There's a 40% tariff. On, on cheeses, if you, you have no deal, 12% on wines, 10% uh, on cars, which is worrying the German automotive industry, as Roberts quite rightly says. Um, and a Nissan UK, by the way, has talked of like, uh, you know, if it loses, if you get no deal, um, it will actually seek to get a much larger share of the British market. So there's a bit of adjustment going on at the moment. But yeah, financial services is a sort of disappointing area. It's obviously more relevant to Britain. Uh, the EU is pushing, obviously, on the good side. Um, but it, it, I think, you know, financial services is something that's been developed through the WTO, will come back to and expand over time. And, and uh, with FDAs, it's not the end of the story. You're always adding bits and pieces to them uh, as you go. Uh, and every time a WTO makes a new agreement, like public procurement, whatever, 
it, it often gets added to existing FDAs uh, and that's the way you progress. And, and, you, and we, we've agreed to the GDPR thing already, but are you confident that they can get agreements on things like data adequacy mm. and sort of digital alignment? Because this is really important. This could be a cliff edge. Yeah, well, data is very important. And uh, sometimes it, it, I've spoken to data companies sometimes and they don't realize you need this agreement to actually trade, you know. Um, yeah, data is a very important one. Uh, and there's lots of issues. You know, American companies have had similar issues trading in the EU. Uh, it does need agreement and it works both ways. I mean, what I often find in all of this is that there's no recognition that it works both ways, which is my point. You know, we're a much larger market to EU exporters than the other way around. And that's not been recognized. It's as if, you know, they're doing us a favor. Um, and I don't think that's helped the negotiations, you know, and, and it's held us back and it's got us into this potentially a crisis mode where we may not have time to, to uh, you know, get a deal through. But I, I'm with everyone here that uh, EU does it the last moment, 2 a.m. in the mo morning, probably New Year's morning or whatever, <laughs> um, is entirely possible. But the one thing I know from the British government, quite rightly, is we're not going to compromise on sovereignty. And a lot of this is encroaching into sovereign areas, which you don't ask other countries like Canada, Australia, Japan, or all around the world to do. And that is the sticking point. And I think as soon as that's recognized and adjustments are made, then we can have a deal. Otherwise, there will not be a deal. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Charlie, um, a certain nameless BBC journalist recently tweeted that the deal could be ended, uh, ended up being voted on on the 28th of December. So ruining all of your Christmases. Um, primarily due to translation needs. Um, surely this is probably part of Macron's desperate attempt to protect the French language. Um, but my real question is, you know, assuming there is a deal put on the table end of this week, early next week, do we expect anybody in the European Parliament who obviously got to uh, pass it to oppose the deal? Do you think there will be any issues on that side? I don't really think it will, because uh, the stakes are too high. Uh, I mean, on the one side, one could um, consider the democratic implications of, you know, MEPs being dispersed all over Europe, having to read, uh, you know, 1,800 pages in just only a few days uh, without any any real access to to uh, uh, staff that are on holiday leave and so on and so forth so maybe one or two would would uh, actually uh, object to that process but I think in the end uh, the government um, you know Berlin Paris um, so on and so forth will probably get in in touch with their MEPs to to uh, underline the importance of getting a potential deal through. Uh, and um, consider this also. Um, this week, uh, the European Parliament is debating Turkey again. Uh, the EU has issued 12 resolutions to, since 2016 on Turkey with paragraphs that condemn, deplore, and express strong concern. But have they actually passed a resolution that calls for any substantial economic actions, i.e. customs union suspension, ending pre-accession financing? No. EU is Turkey's biggest trading partner. It, it's got huge leverage, almost half of Turkey's trade. But Turkey is only 4% of EU trade. Yet even in a non-binding resolution, the EP has been extremely cautious in its wording. So why would they vote down a Brexit deal that has the backing of the council, the commission, and uh, Her Majesty's government. I don't see it happening. Mm, yeah, thank you. And Charlie, I mean, I know you've been very active on this Turkish issue, um, so <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, I'm flitting around a little bit, but uh, and time is ticking on. Could, but, I, yeah. could I just, just yeah. plug that this is the new direction paper um, from a few years ago. It's about the UK market from EU eyes. I think it's still on the website, the new direction. Um, uh, but what it does is actually it shows how important the British market is to the EU. The tables like this, for example, uh, which, which is a way of showing like, you know, Germany is about 27% of all exports to the UK come from Germany. 
And, and so the politics of it are very important to the vote, in my view, because eight countries dominate, um, uh, you know, 90% of all exports to the UK. Um, the big names, you know, and 50% is, is just made up with Germany, France, and the Netherlands. So We've lost David. We've lost David. I'm assuming he was the author of that report as well. <laughs> We missed it. Hopefully we'll get David back in a second. I think that was an ad break. <laughs> it was an ad break, yes. Yeah, we need to do more on broadband, all of us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Stuart, um, we need to talk about the internal market bill um, because obviously it's not you know, widely understood on this of the, uh, of the channel. Uh, so perhaps could you explain a little bit about it, what the UK is trying to achieve? I mean, we see today that it's had some opposition in the House of Lords. Um, but despite the stated aims, does the EU's reticence risk creating a hard border in Ireland and jeopardise the Good Friday Agreement? No, quite the opposite. Um, and it might be apposite to explain uh, the role of the House of Lords. It's not uh, a Senate. Uh, it, it doesn't have veto powers. It has delaying powers. And its role is to improve and scrutinise uh, government legislation. And ultimately, it has to defer to the elected House which is the House of Commons. And as we know, the Boris Johnson government has an 80-seat majority in that. I think it was a deliberate strategy by the government in September to send a, 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 um, a lightning bolt of electricity through the negotiations. Because I think at that stage, from Barnier down, there was a certain complacency and acceptance that the EU had all the cards in its hand. And it was going to force the um, UK by, by increment to, to, to capitulate. And I think it forced the EU back to the table. Now, the point of it is uh, the internal market bill is essentially in the event of a no deal uh, occurring to protect the uh, integrity of the UK single market. And even especially Theresa May, but certainly Boris Johnson has always taken the view that we had to protect the role of uh, commerce and trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, and that was something, not least because, of course, th there were 10 uh, Democratic Unionist MPs that, that made up effectively the government in the 2017 pa Parliament. So I, I think we should we should bear that in mind that it was a a method of restarting the talks um, i don't believe that it was about breaking international law because we're a dualist regime in the uk you can only sign up to an international treaty not directly it doesn't have direct effect but by legislation in the uk parliament and i think that's important for people to realize but in answer to your question that legislation which seeks to derogate in relatively a small number of areas around customs checks, for instance, uh, will fall away in the event of a comprehensive trade deal, thin as it might be. And so I, th I think, therefore, it will be OTOs to the whole process if we have a December the 28th deal signed uh, by the UK and the EU. Excellent. And, and will there be further objections from within the UK as well, or do you think that they will all be resolved in time? It, to to the bill, yeah. Well, I think the passage of the bill is such that the uh, that the, the European Parliament is likely to ratify a deal, uh, given that they're looking at legal text now. As I say, five hundred pages or more, um, and, and therefore I think they they will ratify the bill before the um, sorry the trade treaty before the bill eventually comes back to the Commons in the new year. So I, I think one will outrun the other. Um, one last thing I would say, uh, just coming back to the previous comment, I'm not so uh, pragmatic or insouciant about uh, opposition in the European Parliament. I do think there is talk that um, a review period of, say, five, ten years' time for this deal might not find favour in the European Parliament because I think there's a mutual agreement that we want to get this out of the way. And the idea that we'll go through this pain and agony in five or ten years on fish and on governance and level playing field, I, I'm not sure European parliamentarians will be that keen on it. 
Well, let, well thank you. Let, let's ask one, Robert. Uh, in case this doesn't pass, um, are we going to see the European Union offer extended periods of negotiation? Uh, I mean, you know, it'll be dressed up as in order to prevent economic uncertainty in the EU as well as the UK, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, um, and, and following on from the previous comment, what do you think? Uh, could, well, well I, I think uh, uh, it's good that Parliament is not uh, negotiating. Parliament is either ratifying or not. And this is a good thing. Why I'm saying this? Because, uh, well, uh, uh, my guess is this current Parliament is, 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 is actually very... Very strange, there are so many new newcomers. It doesn't mean that the, if you are first time elected, it's bad. But there are so much populism in the different uh, parts of, of factions. Uh, well, so, well, because I'm working on all this recovery, resilience facility issues with the big money and also MFF, it's really just a disaster. If you are uh, listening, some uh, green uh, social democrats, uh, communist groups, and also some of them on the right side, unfortunately. Mm. Um, uh, I don't, don't mean ECR, but uh, <laughs> ID, ID group. So, but uh, but I, I don't think that parliament will be uh, with a significant numbers vote against deal if the deal will be done. I think it would be ratified. So, because I think calls from the capitals like Berlin, Paris, so on, those groups in, in a in EPP, in, in liberal groups, so they in Renew Europe, so they, they will create a majority. And also in, in our group, I don't know why we would be against if it's the deal done and it's, uh, it's okay on both sides because we still have a British friend. So uh, we, <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's also very important, as I told, to keep a good, uh, good, uh, good relationships with the UK after Brexit, of course, on, on EU, majority of EU politi politicians. So I am sure that uh, it would be ratified. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, I'm not so sure what will happen uh, if the rule of law or some other things will not resolve this, uh, all this recovery instruments uh, and, and MFF. So that is more dangerous. But I also think that at the end, also the majority of the parliament will be supporting in December also this, this issue. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> Charlie, just sort of um, the same yeah. thing, really. I mean, I, I saw uh, James Crisp in The Telegraph recently reported that you know, there could be like 10, 15 year review clauses in the trade deals and fishing agreements, uh, as well as probable fresh negotiations uh, on all the big issues, Northern Ireland, foreign policy, cooperation, dialogue and all the rest of it. Um, do you think we could see a, a, a whole series of mini deals on various issues, you know, even if the, the trade agreement itself falls through? Well, there are aspects that point in, in that direction, not least uh, the um, uh, interest of European industry to, you know, keep uh, to keep up production, to keep up trade. Um, but um, I'm not sure that uh, the EU will show such flexibility. I mean, uh, it was the EU lack of flexibility that led to this impasse in the first place. First, during Cameron's renegotiation where the EU only offered token reforms and now during Boris Johnson's withdrawal negotiation, um, not least the demand that the ECJ should have continued uh, jurisdiction in the UK. Uh, I mean, um, some held up hope that the EU would learn from its past and show flexibility, but uh, considering the path that the EU is hell-bent on, realizing its United States of Europe vision, I think that uh, they will never let the UK challenge this, either from inside as before or from outside in the future. So um, some mini deals, yes, but they would be restricted. Mm, yeah. Well, it's a quote, yeah. quote the cliche, we're leaving, we're leaving Europe. We're leaving the EU, not Europe. Yeah. Can I <laughs> finish it off? Can I, well, I, can I just say on many deals, Richard, I, I think I invented the phrase because when I was an MEP, uh, we did vote on about 40 different measures like um, aviation and transport trucks and Erasmus and the Northern Ireland peace process and all of that. There was quite a long list, quite rightly, and I credited the EU with being ready for it, you know, and that was... I've, I've gone when we last tried to leave, but I think it's about 2018, I think we voted on it. And, and so I think that is a sensible way forward. And I understand the negotiators have spoken about it. It's very important to keep the, the show on the road. If we have to go to no deal for now, then, uh, you know, we can do these mini deals and we can then change the negotiating guidelines to trade, you know, trade focus and get a proper trade deal that advantages us all, you know. 
Sure. By the way, on regulations, I mean, what I don't understand is, you know, every FTA that the EU does has this regulatory committee or forum, which whose job is to sit down and discuss new regulations or maybe deregulation in our case, um, you know, and like the joint committee, really. And, and so that that could all be shunted, in my view, into that committee. And you could have this debate, you know, day in, day out, if you wish to, about, you know, the effect of different regulations. And, uh, you know, I, I was in Peru and, you know, talking about this, you know, and it, it, it's, it's used all the way. And it makes sense because, you know, if there's a showstopper regulation, if you introduce this law, we're going to have to negotiate the trade agreement or drop the clause or whatever, financial services clause. That's fair enough, you know. And, and that, I think, could unpick this, the problem we've, we, we're having. We just sort of change the debate so we do it day by day in a, in a, a committee and not, you know, as a sort of bring all the talks down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to turn to a question that's come in from one of our Facebook viewers. Uh, perhaps Stuart, you can have a crack at this one. Um, it's always been down to the wire to impress the voters back home. Any comment you read the UK future trade agreement with Commonwealth partners, especially ones who are in the EU itself, like Malta? Any legal loopholes that can be exploited to smoothen out any EU political obstacles? Well, I think we are in a situation where the uh, ambition that we had four years ago for a, for a much fuller comprehensive trade deal has gone. I don't agree with David that we're likely to head to a formal no deal or WTO process. I don't think that is going to happen. Um, but I do think that we're going to have to continue debating on a bilateral basis with uh, a number of countries, particularly on uh, service industries. It's always seemed a bit strange to be told on the one hand by the EU Council that we're going to be out in the cold, we're going to be freezing on our own, with no friends in the world, but stuck between uh, the, Biden, the new Biden administration and a resurgent European Union. And then we're equally told, on the other hand, but of course, you have to follow our regulatory and legal guidelines and you have to have dynamic alignment because you're such a massive economic threat and a powerhouse. You can't really be both. But I, I think that the main issues will be solved by the 28th of December, but clearly countries like Luxembourg and Malta, which have got growing and powerful and influential uh, financial services industries, we're going to have to do deals with them. And, you know, in practical terms, on things like data adequacy, there's a perfectly good EU-Japan data adequacy deal, which can be consolidated on mutual recognition of professional qualifications. That's work in progress, as is uh, social security, uh, pet passports. These are all things that we can settle. Uh, and of course, citizens' rights, which is a massive issue. So, you know, I, I, I think the best thing is we will not have a massive cataclysmic blowout uh, right in the middle of a second wave of COVID. Uh, and, and I think once we get a deal and once we get a vaccine, I think that will change the weather both in the EU and the UK politically. But the final thing I would say is the political damage to the Johnson administration of no deal is not what it would have been to the May administration, because the gap between this thin trade deal and no deal is not that great. And therefore, the government wouldn't fall. It would survive and it may even prosper. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we've got just a quick round for final comments. Uh, David, uh, despite COVID and the general hysteria, Brexit it still remains very controversial in the UK. Um, do you think, uh, wh what do you see about, we should just talk about the impact, potential impact of it having on UK trade. Um, and, um, you know, what are the key impacts that you see will happen both sort of short and medium term? So the impact of? Uh, of, of, of getting the deal done in time, okay. Uh, the impact on, on, on UK trade. Bear in mind that Brexit is, is quite controversial. It still has many detractors. Um, yes, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, um, you will get cries of betrayal if, yes. if you know, it's seen to be too uh, favourable to the EU if it goes ahead. Um, it, I mean, clearly there are certain sectors that get hit very hard by tariffs. Um, but, but as I say, I'm setting it in the context of only 7.5% of the British economy actually trades with the EU in terms of goods. And I think that's overlooked. You know, I, you know, I'm not saying it won't be, it, it will be 
pretty difficult for certain people. The customs decorations anyway have to be done anyway, but it becomes a lot more complex actually applying over 20,000 tariffs that the EU Customs Union actually is involved with. And, and it will be, you know, difficult. And, uh, but I, I think, but, you know, we run the borders, you know, it's not like someone else runs the borders for us, you know, us two governments, the EU and the UK. And so there are the flexibilities in terms of customs, of, you know, being a bit more light touch to, to ease the process if you have to go to no deal. Um, but I mean, I prefer, as I said, I prefer a deal, but I think Stuart's point is really important that we now got such a thin deal. It's even always Canada minus. I know a former commissioner said that's what she wants from us, an EU commissioner. And, and that is wrong. You know, it doesn't advantage either side. And it means that actually no deal becomes more attractive. And that is a hard landing for the EU. And that is overlooked. You know, we will have massive import substitution in this big market. And your 95 billion pound surplus, trading surplus, could be at serious risk as a result, which is why I think the German industry is a bit uh, worrying a bit at the moment. Yeah, thanks. So, Charlie, the question I wanted to, just final comments, I wanted to bring back to you was, overall, has the EU handled these negotiations poorly or well, in your view? Can't hear you. Can you unmute? Unmute. Yeah, so um, the EU has handled the negotiations in a bureaucratic, professional manner, as one would expect. Its shortcomings are political and strategic in nature and are directly tied to the Ever Closer Union, a project that the UK blocked, but that now is very much on the agenda. And um, it's, it will have to, to um, uh, reckon with, with the fact that, uh, it, or make peace with the fact that uh, the future looks different than the past. Uh, the, the UK will be a sovereign nation and as as soon as the EU realizes that it will be able to strike a deal that is beneficial to both parties and to 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 yeah to us all in the long run yeah thank you and of course it has an impact on any aspirations the EU might want with further trade deals particularly looking to America with the change in administration most definitely um, thank you. Now, finally, just to end off, Roberts, would you like to make any final comments before we close off? Because we've got uh, just Well, two. I just uh, would like to say one sentence on what you asked, Charlie, about uh, how you <laughs> handled this negotiation. I would say uh, you did it in style, in, in, in classical EU style. So, and that's why we expect also final drama with a, with a good success at the end, like, like in theater, everything before Carter, you know fall down will be very very nice so <laughs> i'm smiling a bit so because it's it's uh, i think uh, let's let's have it also some time smiling and some jokes you know on a very serious topic so we'll be fine superb thank you roberts and we're out of time so i'd just like to say a big thank you to all of you on the panel for this very lively and interesting debate Obviously, it's got further to go and we shall be watching it closely. Um, the whole discussion is recorded on our website. Uh, should you wish to review any of the comments, they're at uh, the ECR party uh, site. And please do join us for future Europe debate webinars, uh, details of which can be found on our social media platforms and websites. Um, other than to thank the panel and thank all of you for watching today, I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Stay safe. And I hope to see you here again soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.